Okay, so we are going to go through chapters 12 to 16. Um, there's a lot of chapters here. Uh, as we can see, lots of things happen. We're all leading up to the trial, which is the next section, um, which is kind of the climax of the book. So chapter 12 is about the African-American community. Chapter 13 is about Aunt Alexandra. Chapter 14, the main focus is seeing some racial and social prejudice uh, and learning about Dill and Boo Radley. Chapter 15, the focus is the mob. So the mob tries to kill Tom without a trial. Atticus and his children prevent this lynching. It is specifically called lynching when a group of white Caucasian men uh, would come, in, especially in the South in the 1930s, and kill without a trial, without any evidence, um, often wrongly, uh, an African-American man accused of uh, some sort of crime in the eyes of the mob. And again, there was no logic or reason to this, and it was a terrifying time for this community especially. Chapter 16, we see racial and social prejudice growing and we see that the only way to destroy this is through empathy. And keep in mind, empathy is different from sympathy. Empathy is about like truly understanding another individual. So we see a couple of things going on for the characters. Um, Atticus wishes Scout could be herself, but he also knows that she must follow the conventions of society. Uh, he defers to his sister, Aunt Alexandra. He himself is the so-called black sheep of the family. He wants to escape that family pressure, but he doesn't know how to do this for his daughter. He believes that personal character is more important than family lineage, and he tries to teach this, but he's unable to. Um, there's the comment made by Scout that he tries to be both a father and a mother, but she realizes he's unable to fulfill that mother role, um, that it takes women to be the ones to... Uh, subject other individuals into following the established conventions of society. Scout is faced with gender roles. She's faced with the role of a high-class Caucasian woman, which is what she is uh, going to inherit. And you could compare her to Skeeter in The Help. Uh, she sees her aunt making the delicacies for the tea party. She's told her family history by her aunt. And she attempts to avoid these conventions of a woman's role, but she's unable to do so with her aunt. And throughout the entire novel, uh, Scout attempts to be herself and to not follow uh, the rules laid out by gender roles, and yet she's unable to do so, just like her community is unable to overcome racial prejudice. When she defends her father in chapter 15 from the mob, she's called a lady for the first time. So that's key. Jem is starting to grow up, and like I had said earlier, he is older than Je Scout, and so he's growing up at a different pace than she is. Um, the distance grows between them. He tells Scout to be good because he's worried about his father, and he wants to protect Atticus. That's really his main goal. He idolizes his father, which means he sees his father in the most positive light, um, and, and that's because he respects him so much. Later in... Um, Chapter 14, when Dill runs away from home and comes to the Finch household, Jem breaks that childhood code and tells Atticus that Dill ran away. He realizes that parents would worry, and that increases the distance between Dill and Scout, who are younger, and Jem. It talks about how he's outgrown the treehouse, and he's also outgrown his childhood. Um, at the end of chapter 14, we see that the children are growing in terms of understanding others as well. Before they had previously seen Boo as a scary individual. Now they, they see him with more empathy um, when he is talking about uh, running away, they figure maybe Boo Radley doesn't have anywhere to run off to. And they recognize that the worst place is having nowhere to go. This shows that the children's gain empathy for Boo. It's a really big change because previously they had fear uh, from him only. Uh, they saw him as a ghost, and this is the first time they really have that empathy and start to humanize him. Uh, when we start looking at the mob, we see some symbols in chapter 15. Um, I know I added it in here. So here's my beautiful drawing. We have the uh, door to the 
the jail in the courthouse and Attica sits under a single lamp and he is reading a book. It's really important that he brings a book and not a gun for protection. We know already that he is a good shot and yet he chooses knowledge to defend himself with and reason. There's the single light in the darkness and that represents that he himself is that single light, that hope against the mob, against racism and that is Atticus. In the mob, they themselves are symbolic, that mob mentality, it will lead to murder. It's made up of good people individually, but there's a loss of reason that occurs in a group. And this is juxtaposed to Atticus, who is portrayed as the voice of reason. And the men say, you know what we want, get aside, Mr. Finch. And in turn, Atticus responds, you can turn around and go home, Atticus said pleasantly. It's really important, like we see him fighting um, courteously, politely, he does not raise his voice, he doesn't yell, he doesn't use his fists, he is that uh, moral figure and authority. This is really uh, juxtaposed compared to Hectate, because as the sheriff, it's a symbol of justice and the law, and it represents how ineffective the institutionalized police are. Uh, the only people who are able to stand up to the mob is an individual of the uh, most, uh, moral and righteous uh, conscience. So we have some themes here. In terms of integrity, Atticus protects Tom from the mob, as they would have lynched him. And Scout also reminds the Cunninghams of their humanity. This is brave. She's brave without knowing. Um, she is still quite innocent here, but she's able to change their minds. And later in chapter 16, Atticus says, you made Walter Cunningham stand in my shoes for a minute. That was enough. And that reflects back on his earlier statement in the beginning of the novel where he talks about walking around in someone else's skin, being truly able to understand where they're coming from. That's empathy. Empathy is the only thing that can destroy that racism and cause someone to think differently. Um, some other things in terms of racism, especially subtle racism and segregation, we see the description of the black church in the graveyard in chapter 12. Um, and it's really interesting how the white men gamble in the black church. It is seen as a sin to gamble. Uh, in Christianity, there's um, a section in the Bible where Jesus throws out uh, money lenders and talks about how the church is a holy place, not one of money. And we see this here as well in the novel, the children get in trouble for even the thought of gambling. Uh, it's hypocritical that the white man choose to gamble in the African-American church. And that hypocrisy is kind of remarked upon. Uh, we also see that segregation in the chapter 16 when we have the start of the trial, the African-Americans sit in the balcony, they're unable to sit on the main floor uh, with the other Caucasian individuals. And Atticus, he's very idealistic and he has a grand hope. Uh, he states, the Ku Klux Klan's gone and it'll never come back. This is a false belief of Atticus. He's optimistic about the world, but it is not reality. And even now in 2020, there is the KKK in the United States. There's a resurgence of white nationalism and white supremacy. This has not gone away. And it's um, quite a stark reminder when in 1930, there are a lot of parallels to 2020. You would think that the world has changed, um, but it hasn't. Uh, so innocence, uh, we see this with Dill. He thought he would get a new father figure. Um, earlier on, we learned that Dill doesn't have a father. Uh, his mother remarries and yet his parents aren't inter his, interested in him. He has this quote, uh, they do seem to get on better without me. And that is truly one of the most uh, damaging things you can do to a child is simply neglect. Uh, we also see this in terms of the court case. It involves the alleged rape of Mayella Ewell. If we remember who the Ewells are, we know that Burris Ewell was introduced in school with Scout. He doesn't have a mom. Their father is a drunkard who spends all of the money that the family receives from charity on alcohol and not food for his children. They don't go to school. And they are represented as the lowest of the social class. So here's that social class ladder. So Bob Ewell has the lowest social status and he is believed in a community due to his race alone. Uh, the only reason that there'd be a court case with support for the Ewell family is simply because they're claiming that an African-American man raped Mayella, his oldest daughter. 
Um, the Cunninghams also have a low social status, but Scout reminds them that they are the same regardless of the fact that there's this social ladder. So here's your social ladder and you'd have the Finches at the top there. Um, they're a wealthy, highly educated family. There's a lot of respect. Uh, other people who belong to that class is Miss Maudie, Mrs. DuBose. Further down in terms of uh, uneducated individuals, in terms of social uh, inequality, we have the Cunningham family. And at the very bottom rung in that ladder, we have the Ewells. But these individuals are Caucasian or white. Um, and so therefore, below them are placed the African-American community. And that is the only reason why the Ewells are believed. If this had been um, the rape of male, a Ewell by someone of a high class family would be treated very differently. The other thing we see um, in chapter 12 is uh, some social inequality within the church uh, itself. There's individuals that disagree. So for example, Lula reveals inequality. She is a necessary voice to bring balance to the portrayal of the African-American community. Um, and I'll add that in there. Um, it is important to recognize that you need a variety of voices. If we only had um, African-American individuals who are strong and righteous and morally sound individuals, then you have an unequal balance. Calpurnia is a great example of a strong, educated African-American woman. Uh, Tom Robinson is a very righteous individual as well. But uh, Lula shows that bias, uh, especially when she says and objects to the children coming to church and she says, they've got their church, we've got ours. And that social segregation has now been put in place and she wants to continue to uphold that. And we can understand where she's coming from, for sure, in terms of facing that inequality her whole life. Uh, but then that is, um, gone against through Calpurnia. And Calpurnia says, but it's the same God, ain't it? And she goes against that view. This is really important that we have dissenting voices to create a realistic portrayal. This is the same. There are some strong individuals who are really outstanding, like Atticus Finch or Miss Maudie, but we also have very negative characters like Mrs. DuBose and the Ewells. And that's important because, again, you're not having one character where all of the people in the book who are white are righteous and perfect. That would be an unrealistic portrayal. So it's important we have both of these voices. Um, we also see another moment where Miss Maudie fights using the Bible and scripture. She defends religion. Uh, the author defends religion, but the author is critiquing fundamentalists and extremists within religion. And again, the foot washing Baptists come back and they condemn her and, and her flowers, and she defends herself using the Bible. So the author here is critiquing how individuals could manipulate religion um, and showing it through a strong Christian female, Miss Maudie, uh, that there is a better way to be a kind and caring Christian individual. And finally, love. Calpurnia is a mother figure for Scout and Jam. She defends the children and the children bridge the gap between those races largely because of her and because she has a larger role in their lives as their own mother had passed away. And she is that mother figure that's the only one within the novel for them as Aunt Alexandra is much more of an imposing authoritarian figure and Scout never sees her as someone with um, love and affection until she's older. Uh, there's also a lot of love between the children and their father. They refuse to leave him. They even disobey the order when he tells them to leave in chapter 15 because Jem sees more of reality and he knows that if they leave, the men will would potentially use force against Atticus. And because of that, and even because of that innocence that Scout has, they are able to save their father and uh, remind the Cunninghams that they are all the same people. And for that, the Cunningham family uh, recognizes how brave and um, uh, morally conscious the uh, Finches are. And that uh, is chapters 12 to 16.